started. My name is Tianyi Kua. I'm the chair for this panel discussion this evening. The first item of business, obviously, is I, I need to apologize on behalf of LSE for our having made an error in the, the, the double booking of this room. I mean, this was something that was supposed to start at 6.30, but because of this, that, the other, the room ended up being used for something else. My impression is that there's been an epidemic of double bookings throughout the school, so we've not been singled out. It's simply a problem with the, the booking system. But so starting half an hour late, nonetheless, welcome everyone to this evening's uh, civil panel discussion, the Confucius Institute for Business London panel discussion. Where we're very happy to have, and I'll introduce, say more details, say more in a minute, Tom Harris, so Thomas Harris and Stephen Perry, who are up here on the panel, and we're going to discuss China and its new leaders, how it matters for global business. <laughs> now, as many of you will be regulars here at LIT, you know that we are perfectly okay if you want to bring up your smartphone or your iPad and tweet. As the, as the evening proceeds, uh, we only request that if you do do that, please set your phone to silent or to buzz so that you know, we don't get a constant stream of interruptions. Although the uh, Twitter hashtag has not been announced, I would like to encourage people who do want to use that, use the hashtag LSDCIBL, LSDCIBL, all in one word, mm -hmm. so we can continue the conversation offline and even afterwards. Now, just to get the session going now, as many of you will know, but I still do need to, to say, Sybil at LSE is the Confucius Institute for Business in London. And so it's one of several dozen Confucius Institutes throughout the United Kingdom. And I need to make very clear, Sybil here at the LSE seeks to promote the Chinese language and culture for the use of business in London and to improve understanding of Chinese business culture. Now when I say business here, this evening in particular, Sir Thomas is obviously from a bank. And so rather than constantly say business, banking, and finance, when I say business, this evening, I will include this banking and finance. The panelists this evening, Sir Thomas Harris, <coughs> Vice Chairman of Asia, Standard Chartered Bank, and Stephen Terry. Chairman of the 48 Group Club, which many of you will have already had engagement with. It's an independent business network that provides, that promotes connections with China, and it's been doing that for over six decades. In fact, the founding members of this 48 Group Club, also known as the Icebreakers, were the first Westerners to resume trading with China in the modern era. And by that, I mean since the establishment of the People's Republic of China. To get the discussion going, I just want to say a few words to set the stage and then turn over to the panelists who will then run away with it. When we schedule, when we schedule this panel discussion, gosh, from long, long ago in May, we had sought to focus then on what was China's then new leadership. But little did we know that this week alone would be when, well gosh, Boris Johnson biked Beijing. Hmm. He hung out at Peking University. And from PKU, he welcomed even more mainland Chinese students to London because, he said, <coughs> London has more universities than any other city. Because he forgot that actually Beijing, where he was making this announcement, actually has more universities than London does, but never mind. The sentiment is admirable, and China, London, is open and welcoming of ever more participants in higher education. Today, many of you will also know, is when George Osborne announced new relaxed rules for Chinese banks doing business here in London. And the attempt, very explicitly by Osborne and others in the government, is to make London an RMB, Renmin Fee, global trading hub. These last few weeks, in fact, have seen a frenzy of announcements <coughs> on inward investment deals from China into the United Kingdom. There's a discernible step up in UK-China relations after what many people might have thought was a little bit of a chill prior to this. One, just one more quick thing I have to say. Anytime we talk about China, its leadership, 
doing business in China, which is what we're after this evening. We need also to reflect, if only very briefly, on the United States. But the United States, these last few weeks, is in political shutdown, much worse than anyone imagined it would be, would be possible. I mean, just to say, Obama has had to stay back in Washington, D.C., and this key summit meetings in Asia just last week, leaving China a clear run and building good relations with the emerging world. Many US allies in Southeast Asia are now openly wondering if there can be any counterweight to China's influence and power in that region. China's president <coughs> this last week became the first foreign leader to address the parliament of Indonesia, a country that until very recently had prided itself on its special connection with the US president. Now all this is background. We're not here to hash over background or to discuss geopolitics, but to think through how global business engages with China. I have to say up front what I had planned to discuss at this meeting way back in May now seems pale and insipid compared to these exciting events over this last week. So with that, as a memory of a distinct you know, backdrop to what we're going to say, I'm now going to turn to the panelists. And I'm first of all going to ask them to give a short opening statement based mm -hmm. on, if they wish, a personal encounter with China, China's leadership, global business, business in China. Uh, there are official accounts of events that we will all have heard, but I thought that in this nicer, intimate setting, we could hear a personal statement from each of our panelists. And then after that, I want to try and guide the discussion. I don't think I can do more than point, because many of you will know these are two very powerful personalities. I've got sitting up here on the stage, and no matter what I say to them, they're going to do what they want to do. <laughs> so I'm going to try and point a little bit of the discussion where we're going to go. Again, with a focus on China's leadership and global business. But after that, you know, I apologize for it. Only the demo recently is uh, very, very the last few minutes to start, but provided we have time, we very much hope we can do, I hope that we'll be able to have an active Q&A session and engage the audience as well. So let me turn now to the panelists. So first I would like to begin with Stephen Perry, who I've already introduced as the chairman of the Podium Group Club. Stephen, if you could... Look to me. <laughs> Tonight is a night for breaking rules. <laughs> As they said in Big Bang Theory, it is anything goes Tuesday. So it's anything goes Tuesday. <laughs> I would like Stephen to go first. Uh, like me to, to make a short opening statement based on a personal account before we then dive into the short study. Okay. Um, uh, um, first of all, Danny, thank you very much indeed for inviting us here and uh, for being here yourself. I, I, I have a great, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> People have started going to sleep, so it's very good. Um, I remember coming to one of the early LSE forums <coughs> and hearing you speak about the um, trade deficit between America and China, and you gave um, an analysis of the background of that deficit and how it had previously occurred, existed in between Asia and uh, America. And I realized then that I was listening to somebody who not only had opinions on China, but had a great deal of uh, time and um, commitment to studying the facts and working out the realities of the situation around China. And I'm always very pleased to be on any uh, panel with yourself. I think you're one of the uh, significant people in the United Kingdom on the subject of China. Uh, I wish I could say the same for Tom. <laughs> It's how I've known for many years. For those of you who understand football, I'm an Arsenal supporter and he's a Spurs supporter. And that difference between us is probably goes along with this. Every, 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 every single, every single <laughs> issue that we get. <laughs> Tom is somebody I've known for many years and um, had uh, great respect for um, his um, uh, um, long, long time in, in government service. and than in, in the world of business. And um, while we may disagree about some aspects of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the development of China, uh, what Tom has to say is an exciting part of the debate. Because one thing's for sure is nobody knows the answers. 
and the answer to the best value through um, uh, an engagement of, of different ideas. And uh, I'm quite sure we'll get some of that to the slide. Um, and, uh, and I love your Confucius Institute. It brings together people in informal and changing times, literally. And, um, and, and I always enjoy coming to your events. And the LSE is a very special place for me because I was here when it was occupied. <laughs> so I've given away a little bit of my background in, in politics. Um, and, and, and I think just by way of, a, of an introductory personal statement, um, I, I, I've um, done most things with China in, in my work career. I've um, traded commodities with China. I've uh, developed consumer goods from China to the British and American markets. I've consulted on long-term strategies on China. I've talked on China, thought about China, grew up with China because my father was one of those first people that was there 60 years ago. And um, I echo what my father said, that there is uh, no such thing as an expert on China, just varying degrees of ignorance. Um, and, and, and he was right. Um, but I think what I would say is that uh, over my years of working with China, which is unfortunately now over 40 years and uh, many, many tens of hundreds of visits to China and America, where I've done a lot of business between America and China, um, I've realized that um, uh, Sir David Tang last night when he talked about uh, uh, the need for a meritocracy in China really doesn't understand what it takes to become a leader in China. It is, it is really a meritocracy. The people who rise to the top in China have uh, survived an incredible system of selection. I've had the good fortune to uh, meet many of them on their way up and some of them at the top and some who have been to the top and uh, fallen off the top. Uh, one thing I can say for sure is they're very experienced people um, and they're very widely read and they're very well educated and very well informed and they would have to be, wouldn't they? Because they are dealing with a country of 1.4 billion people and trying to transform it in a way that uh, we have done maybe uh, in 175, 200 years. They're trying to do it in a total period of about 60 years. So China's new leadership is very important. I think it's a transformational leadership. We'll talk about that as we go on. And does it matter to global business? It's, it, 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 it is everything to global business, to understand the agenda of China's new leaders and the impact that it's going to have on the global business community. So, is that, that Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Danny, and uh, thank you to the Confucius Business Institute for organising uh, tonight. Um, what matters to global business is a vast uh, subject, and I don't um, pretend that I'm going to tackle it. I'm going to focus in my introductory remarks on what the new leadership means. Um, for a multinational company like the Standard Chartered Bank, um, because I think that the new leadership represents an inflection point in the political and economic development of China, um, which is going to unfold in the next few years in ways that I'm personally quite uh, excited about. Let me um, say just briefly a few words about Standard Chartered in China, just to set the context. We, we're probably actually the oldest bank in China. We set up our first branch in 1858 in um, Shanghai. We've had a continuous presence uh, ever since, but the turning point for us was when China joined the WTO and allowed um, foreign banks like ours to incorporate, which we did in April 2007. We're now one of the largest foreign banks in China with about 100 branches and sub-branches in 25 cities. We are a major, major player in that offshore limited market. And mentioned incidentally, London is there, uh, the global centre. Outside Hong Kong and China, 65% of all the global business in Romania, um, offshore Romania has now taken place in London. And since we incorporated in 2007, our staff have uh, grown 2,300 to currently we employ over 7,000. But just to put that in context, um, all of the foreign banks in China put together account for about 1.7% of the uh, banking business. Uh, this compares with an average in, in emerging markets of about 40%. Um, 
we employ 7,000 people, the four big state owned banks employ about 400,000 people. So, you know, we, to keep this in respect of the still a, a, a very energetic, uh, very small player in the market. So, our uh, aspirations as a global business in China <coughs> are to broaden and deepen our presence in the market. Uh, and above all, to leverage our international network to facilitate China's uh, globalization process. Danny asked us to um, give this a personal uh, spin, and um, I thought tonight I wanted to tell you about an event that I found um, fascinating, which was at the end of the month, I was in Beijing, and I was lucky enough to be invited to the Hall of People where Niki Chan delivered um, a speech um, on the role of the services sector. Now, because banking is a services sector, so I was, it was absolutely fascinating. I just want to draw your attention to one or two things that he said in that speech, because I think in that speech he was giving some signals about the way in which he wants uh, the Chinese economy to be restructured. And you're all aware of the current Chinese government policy to move away from the low emphasis on economic. Can you give it to your microphone? Sorry. Is it on? I trust my wife to turn it on. Um you're all aware that the current Chinese policy is to move away from the over emphasis on exports and capital investment. Uh, towards a society of greater consumption. But what uh, Li Chang said in this speech was that a critical part of that process was the development of the services sector uh, in China. Um, and he, he pointed out, he said, the supply of industrial goods in China is generally sufficient, with some industries showing a serious surplus in production capacity, while many areas of the service sector, in many areas of the services sector, Supply does not um, meet demand. The services sector in China is a significantly lower proportion of GDP than in almost any other emerging market. And he went on uh, to sell out a new policy for the development of services, which included, and I sat open mouth as I listened to him, um, a passage that, looking to the future, China will further develop trade and services, further open up its services sector to the outside world, and to this end will promote national reform. We will focus on expanding trade and services. Last year, trade and services accounted for about 10% of all trade in China, significantly lower than the global average of 20%. And towards the end of his speech, he touched on two ways in which this would be implemented. The government, he said, will explore the possibility of establishing a pilot free trade area, pioneer efforts to develop the service industry and promote the optimization of the industrial structure. A few months later came the announcement that China is setting up a free trade zone in Shanghai, which is targeted explicitly at the services sector. I know Danny wants to come back to this subject, but I think mean, mean, rightly but for the um, sake of uh, brevity, I will just note that that was present in the speech. Yeah. Uh, and the second point he made is that um, China needs to move towards a policy of giving national treatment to foreign investors. As you know, national treatment means to stop discriminating against foreigners. Um, and he said, we will promote international liberalization and facilitation of trade and services all countries should act in accordance with principles of cooperation and mutual benefit, oppose protectionism of every kind, eliminate trade barriers, and resolve the issue of trade imbalances. Now, nobody recognized the significance of what he was saying at the time, because frankly, China's got a long track record of doing exactly the opposite of what he said, and because in multilateral trade negotiations, the Chinese have consistently dragged their heels. To the astonishment of the Western world, and this got very little coverage in the media, two weeks ago, the Chinese ambassador in Geneva delivered letters to a group of countries in Geneva who are called the um, really good friends of services. These are a set of countries 
led by the Americans, the Europeans, the Australians, Singapore, a group of countries who are determined to move ahead with a, 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 what is called a TISA, a trade in services agreement. Again, I could go into details about what this means. But this is a group of countries that say, to hell with the Doha round. We cannot get agreement on a fully multilateral basis. So we're going to negotiate an international agreement to liberalise trade in services. And that letter from the Chinese ambassador two weeks ago said that China wants to join in. I can tell you that has sent uh, shockwaves through the trade policy community. Um, it is implementing Li Keqiang's policy. It means that China has broken away from the BRICS, leaving Brazil, India, and the other laggards um, isolated. And it's placed the Americans in particular in a very difficult position because they had hoped just like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they had hoped to drive these negotiations forward um, without the participation of China. Now that China has applied to join, the Americans are obliged to go to Congress and notify Congress, and they've got 90 days for Congress to come. So we wait and see. But this is, in my world, looking at um, trade in services issues, this is an inflection point. This is the first time China has expressed a serious interest in engaging in the international liberalization of, of trade and services. I'll stop at that point, Danny. Um, I just wanted to use that as an example of the way in which the new leadership is slow. Everything in China is slow. I mean, it's always patient, it's always cautious. China never rushes into anything. But there are clear signs that the new leadership are going to push forward the process of liberalisation. Um, that could be enormously significant to the United Kingdom. The, the British get them slagged off consistently because they don't export as much to China as the Germans. Well, of course they don't, because they don't make the same uh, machinery as the Germans. What we are good at is services. You know, the, the Germans don't even begin to compete with the British when it comes to insurance and banking and people services and creative industries and so on. So services are what we've got comparative advantage on. So if this, if his policy goes through, China could emerge as a really important market for the British services. So I'll stop. Thank you, um, Stephen Tom, for excellent openings, opening statements, pointing the way to a number of questions that I want to come back to. First, let me say, I fully endorse Tom's statement about the excitement that must ripple through all of us on the Shanghai free trade zone. For Tom, as a banker in financial services, that's hugely exciting. For me, as an academic interested in engagement, you know, the Shanghai free trade zone carries with it the backing of Li Keqiang, the promise of liberalization on electronic communications, Gosh, you know, Facebook and Twitter might actually be available in Shanghai in this free trade zone, and it's a thin end to a great degree of liberalization, to a point where Li Keqiang and others talk about how what's happening in the Shanghai free trade zone might give us a snapshot of what China is going to look like in the very near future. And it's hugely exciting to think about what it's going to be like going forwards, as well as to reflect on its analogy with the special economic zones that have been set up 30 years ago in Shenzhen and elsewhere, how that transformed China's development process and indeed transformed the global supply chain in manufacturing. So fully, we need to come back to, to talk about this very exciting development. But I also wanted to make sure both of the panelists have used very interesting language. Stephen said that this, the, the answer to this question up here is, of course, the leadership matter is huge. Tom says that you know, we have gotten to an inflection point in the leadership. Now, for those of us who might be not so much already ingrained in the fine details on high power world finance or what's happening on specific areas of business, many of us, when we think about the new leadership, we think about how the 18th Party Congress earlier this year brought in the so-called fifth generation of leaders. And this fifth generation of leaders has characteristics different from what they the previous generations had. We're all aware of how the new economic plan going forward thinks about 
seriously about rebalancing the economy. We are well aware of how the new leadership talks about corruption as a problem and reforming the process of government to better take care of its people. At the same time that all of this is going on, Xi Jinping has articulated his vision of what China will look like. And it's a vision that pays homage to how the Americans have done this. She has announced the vision of a Chinese dream, self-conscious acknowledgement of how the American dream revitalized and pushed forward this past American century. The characteristics of this new national rejuvenation, this Chinese dream, all also carry inflection points and massive importance. So in thinking this through, what are the characteristics of that dream, what it means to people, how we engage with that as global business people, she has talked about how the Chinese people need to dare to dream, and they need to work to fulfill that dream, and how they need to achieve the two 100s, becoming moderately well off by 2020, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, becoming a fully developed nation, none of this getting trapped in the middle income trap business for them, but becoming a fully developed nation by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. Chinese prosperity is something that is meant to be taken seriously, even more than we have seen since Deng Xiaoping 30 years ago. Now, in light of all this, Stephen, who I will turn to first, very recently, said the following. He said business is best advised to stop thinking about China as a market, but instead to see China as a global challenge. China should not be viewed in one interpretation in terms of what is often promulgated as its peaceful rise and wants to undertake economic relations alone, but in Stephen's words, China needs to be viewed as a global challenge. Now, I would like to first of all invite Stephen to reflect a little bit on this, how he sees this particular connection, and then I will take the discussion forward and talk about services in the Shanghai free trade zone. Stephen. First of all, can I say, I, I'm getting worried, I've really learned the intro set. It's worth a minute in the past. Now's the time to strike up the football. One minute. Anyway. Um, the, 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 I just want to, um, Danny, what you said was very important, the, the, the two 100s. Um, the second 100, that is 2049, is the creation of a modern socialist country. Modern socialist country. And you have to ask yourself the question, what does the inflection point mean? And what does modern socialist country mean? And, the, 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 and I just want to link those two points before I come back to the global business challenge which you asked about. Mm -hmm. The market economy is there to stay in China. So the economy is going to consist of corporations. There are two types primarily of corporations in China, state-owned corporations and private sector. China is beginning to lay down the foundations now for the shareholding structures of a country that will exist in 36 years time. So the, the steps that are being taken now are of critical importance for us to understand what socialism in China means. And I would hazard a guess that it's not very different from the phrase which I, uh, I use, I don't, I, I, I'm sure it's not an original phrase, but a phrase I use called responsible capitalism. What is responsible capitalism? Responsible capitalism is because the, the, the days of capitalism that Marx wrote about when individual entrepreneurs exploited their workforce to make a profit hardly exists today. Today, most businesses are controlled primarily by pension funds and insurance funds and other former funds. They're quite socially owned organizations. They're not socially run. They're run to make quarterly profits. And the workforces that used to exist in those days that labored with their hands hardly exist today because of the advent of technology. So the world in which we live that Marx wrote about and the words like socialism and capitalism come from are very different in their interpretations today 
And when China talks about being a modern socialist country by 2049, I think they're talking about uh, companies that will be run with a social conscience, much more than we understand at the moment in our own countries, although we begin to understand the significance of that because of the failure of the financial crisis. So that the concept of the type of ownership and responsibility of the companies is going to evolve into a much closer um, understanding between West and China as time goes forward. And in the area of redistribution of wealth, I don't see a great deal of difference between what we believe in in the West, which is that growth is the primary source of enhancement of people's lives, but we have to have a form of redistribution to help those who are less fortunate. I'm sure that is what motivates China and what motivates uh, the West. What may be different is that learning from the failures of our welfare state in the West, the Chinese may well impose the major burdens of the welfare state on the business sector in China with the belief that the business sector causes most of those problems and is probably best equipped to deal, for example, with the unemployment problems that are created by their decisions to make people unemployment. So I just want to take that very important point, very, very important point that Dan drew our attention to, that what is happening in China today, as Tom said, moving from low-cost exports to a domestic consumption. didn't quite agree with Tom uh, about the interpretation of domestic consumption because I think investment will still play a very major role in the Chinese economy. But I agree with him entirely about the growth of the services sector. And I agree with him entirely about the overcapacity of the manufacturing industry in China. So there's not a great deal of difference between, between us on that. But here we have the beginning of the emergence of a country which in 2049 may not be that different from what we believe to be the right form of economy and um, structure for our nations as well. There is, of course, big differences between political interpretation. Now, what has happened with China is because of its two major driving forces in 1978, what were they, in my opinion? One was having a population three times the size that it could afford, and the second was its preoccupation with 150 years of history. Those were the two motivating forces that led it to, be, to go for a low-cost export-led economy, to enable it to transform its economy, and then to move to a more self-reliant domestic economy based in Asia, based on and its, and its 14 neighboring nations. That's where China uh, has, has moved towards, starting from 1978, towards an end period of 1949. What it means, because China can't produce enough energy, is that China will import energy in large quantities for many years to come and many other resources. China can no longer be isolated from the world. China is part of the world. That is the first lesson the Chinese leadership have had to come to terms with. The second is that, that in so doing, in being able to import these vast amounts of resources that it needs, it has to export. It has to move up the value chain, it has to buy into brands, it has to buy into retail chains, it has to invest abroad for a number of different reasons, connected with its exports, but also connected with um, maximizing its opportunities for return. So China is in the world forever, but of, of the third point I would make in this context is that if China's corporations are to be able to compete in this world market as they've decided to do, then they must be as innovative and as advanced as companies in the West. And to be so, they've got to be at the cutting edge. Now the problem that the Chinese have got is that Western companies, Western multinationals, do not consider this to be a, a balanced playing field. First of all, they don't consider that China allows the foreigner access to China in the way that China is asking for access to Western markets. That's the first criticism. And the second criticism is that Chinese uh, multinationals are too closely connected to the state. And I make this prediction today that China will change both of those, both of those problems because they couldn't do what Tom has pointed out without recognizing that the demand for reciprocity is going to be very real. The creation of TPPA, the creation of the EU NAFTA, the creation of the, of the services agreement were all mechanisms to contain China's rise by the United States. But just as China decided to enter WTO, 
So China will enter TPPA and these other organizations. To do so, it has to transform those two unequal features of relationship between China and the West. And it's not going to do it just in order to join those organizations. It's going to do it because it coincides with those two objectives that Danny talked about. If China is to be that type of economy in 2049, then it has to be able to compete on its own terms inside China and outside China with foreign firms. So Tom said, 1.4% is the share of market of foreign banks or, for, or for financial services in China. I was told by Long Long Tu when he was here, oh, it sounds like I'm name dropping, I'm not, I was a but I guess I am. <laughs> he said that when they went into WTO, Zhu Rongji approved a 15% ceiling to foreign market share in financial services and they didn't understand why the foreigners only got to 1.4%. I'm sure Tom can tell us in very clear language why it was limited to 1.4%. Yeah. But the very fact that he made that comment to me told me that they had moved beyond 15% and that they had recognized that really when it comes down to it, the British experience, we have two great things to talk about from Britain. One is we have 300 years of stability, and the second we have is that we have been, we're not frightened to allow foreigners to own our industries. It doesn't, it, we have shown it doesn't detract from the efficiency of our economy. So, what is the answer to your question? Very simple. There is no major company in the world that can afford to look upon China as a market. The Chinese will be everywhere in the world, and nobody has yet envisaged any ideas of how to integrate their businesses with China. They view them at the moment as an alternative, a competitor, somebody that they're going to try and fend off. In the end, I believe that there will be major exchanges of equities between Western companies and Chinese companies, and that there will be an evolution of forms of multinationals that don't exist yet in, 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 in the world in many forms. I think we're entering into a period that Tom describes completely accurately as very exciting. But the chairman and chief executives of global companies, I warn you, you cannot sit any longer going to Wimbledon, going to the Royal Opera House, and thinking about whether your quarterly profits will meet the needs of the shareholders. That will last for another three to five years. During that period, the Chinese are going to set you this conundrum. We're coming. How are you going to work with us? The terms of trade between China and the West are set to change. The Chinese will have to make concessions. The West will have to make concessions. But I think they will make the concessions because the alternative is just too terrible to think about. Thank you, Steve. Um, obviously, bold and provocative statements, the kind that we've come to expect from Steve. I would like Tom to respond to some of the pick up or whatever issues here. But in particular, one of the things that Stephen referred to was uh, a, de a degree of aggression in how the Chinese government works with Chinese business in dealing with global business generally. Now, from the perspective of, of observers in China, this is simply tit for tat. What Stephen describes of the United Kingdom being extremely open actually makes the United Kingdom quite an outlier relative to the way the rest of the world does business. When Chinese business, Chinese technology companies, Chinese natural resource companies seek to do investments, collaborations in the United States and elsewhere, they are often slapped down for reasons that I think many economists would consider as simply protectionist. But obviously, this happens all around. So I would like, uh, I know that this is something that, that Tom has thought about and, and, and you know, discussed. Western firms' complaints about discriminatory, regulatory, and antitrust enforcement within China, how this meshes with the vision that the new leadership has announced for China's achieving the 2100? Well, of course it doesn't. Um, the widely held perception um, of Western business operating in China is that they are discriminating against. So clipping here from the Financial Times of a few weeks ago, the American Chamber of Commerce in China complaining about restrictive policies which its members were forced to deal with, the ambiguous, overlapping, conflicting and irregularly implemented regulations, discriminatory policies favoring interested companies, 
David Cuccino, the 70 front of member of EU Chamber of Commerce, uh, yesterday calling for a vast ceiling of political trouble in the business environment. That is, that is the view of Western business trying to do business in China. And to a degree, the Chinese government has acknowledged the validity of some of those complaints and by these proposals to set up a Shanghai free trade so I've got the rules for free trade zone in front of me. And what I find interesting is, time and again, um, these are um, new proposals that, for example, um, the focus of government management should be shifted from ex ante approval to in course and ex post regulation. Now, what does that mean? That means instead of the current arrangements whereby, generally speaking, in China, um, you have to go and get approval before you can do anything new as a Western company. As a bank, you, know, you want to issue a credit card, or as a business, you want to issue a business product. This says in the free trade zone, you can have ex post, so ex ante approval. In other words, the British system, we don't have to go to anybody to ask them to do a new product or a new service. In China, we do. Um, the, the, the job spec for the free trade, free trade zone talks about market access restrictions should be suspended or cancelled, such as requirements on investor qualifications, equity ratio limits, and business capabilities. Implicit in that, of course, is that in the rest of the Chinese market, those freedoms don't exist. So the very fact that Li Keqiang is proposing this free trade zone suggests that there is some substance in those Western business complaints. But let me make a, another point. Stephen has painted the rosy picture. Let me balance that with the scale of the challenges that the Chinese face in order to deliver that dream. And I want to identify three major challenges. Um, Stephen described the, the new management controlled corporation. Now, in China, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to achieve. At the moment, over 40% of output is not from management control corporations. It's not from private sector companies. It's state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises which have extraordinarily close links with local, regional, and central government. Extraordinarily close. Who are used to being subsidized, who are used to being pampered, and a lot of evidence that they do not generate a return on their investments that even justifies their existence. Now, you're going to have to change that. To achieve Stephen's dream, 40% um, of, the, of the business entities in China are going to have to be completely changed. The second big headache facing the Chinese is that that system is based on a financial um, system of uh, what's called repressed finance. What does that mean? It means that Chinese citizens are extremely limited in where they can put their savings. Um, in effect, and I'm oversimplifying, essentially they both put them into banks which offer them a lousy and controlled rate of interest. The rate of interest that you get as a saver in China um, is controlled and restricted and creates an enormously fat net interest margin on how the state-owned banks can lend, which means effectively Chinese savers are subsidizing those state-owned enterprises. I'm over to And the third major challenge for the administration is, of course, the convertibility of the renewable. Now, there's no doubt where the ambition lies, and again, it's implicit in this uh, free trade zone, <coughs> China wants, wants more than ever after the events in Washington in the last two weeks to have a convert, fully convertible currency. But to get from here, with capital controls, a high degree of intervention in the foreign exchange markets, um, uh, 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 the Bank of China controlling the inflows and the outflows, to get to a situation where the renminbi is something that you've just got to heat throw and you can change the sterling of dollars. That is going to be an extraordinarily difficult thing to achieve. And it's because these fundamental, what is involved in getting to Stephen's dream, is going to require absolutely radical and fundamental changes in the way the Chinese economy is 
uh, is right, that means that behind the scenes, although it's clear what the new leadership wants, there's a lot of resistance. I mean, the, the, the new leadership does not have a free reign to do whatever it wants. There are major special interests in China who are fighting back against this. At least the state government in the process, the state government. And it's very significant that when this special free trade zone was opened 10 days ago, yeah. not a senior Chinese minister turned up for the opening ceremony. And we still don't know what the hell the details are of what exactly any of us can do in this free trade zone. There is a major battle going on behind the scenes between the regulators and the, the new government leadership. So I, I want to balance Stephen's absolutely justified optimism, and I share his optimism, but I think we have to be realistic about the fundamental um, obstacles that are facing this government in trying to get to those objectives. I mean, uh, can I just uh, come back? Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Um, because um, I think there's a lot of agreement between Tom and I, and um, Tom's, Tom, Tom's raising a question there about the the, the, the problems of going through this change, and and, and, and he's quite right. Uh, it's, not, it's not overstated the, the, the nature of the problems. But I want to take Tom's uh, uh, memory back um, uh, more recent than the last time Spurs won the football league, uh, but um, <laughs> to about uh, ten years ago, when um, people began to talk about the um, change of the state-owned enterprises, there were. I don't know, uh, over 100,000. And, and, and they said they were going to get rid of them all except for the ones in the pillar industries. And everybody said, you know, it's just not feasible to do it. Well, they did it. Um, so the question is, 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 can the transformations that Tom was talking mm -hmm. about be done? Yes, I think we both agree they could be done. Is there an enormous resistance? I think we both agree that there is enormous resistance. Um, and I would say that why is it that the new leadership was only decided days before it was announced. Because there was enormous um, differences in China about which way to go. And why did Xi Jinping go to Shenzhen immediately after um, he became president? Because he was reinforcing that Deng Xiaoping went to Shenzhen after Tiananmen to say that the economic growth is the priority. So the, the, the decision of the, of, the, of the appointment of this new leadership was yes, economic development is the priority. This transformation that we're both talking about, we both feel comfortable, is on the cards, is the priority of a united leadership. But there is a difference within the leadership, and I think that's where that's where that, that's what we've got to tease out here. Not as to whether to overcome these barriers, but whether to overcome them fast and furious, or whether to let the change be gradual. And I think that's where you look at the Chinese dream. You look at Xi Jinping as a man who looks like he's got judgment, who looks like he's got reflection, and you probably say you want to have a dynamo like Li Keqiang as premier, and you want to have a, a more staid figure like uh, Xi Jinping sitting above him saying this may be going too fast at this stage and we've got to slow it down, and explains exactly why I think the Shanghai Free Trade Zone is an uncertain quantity at this point, exactly as the Shenzhen one was, as Tom pointed out before, it is, I, 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 I don't know what's gone wrong tonight, we seem to agree on those things, but I think, that, I think that the process of change is one of about five years, not 25 years, and not one year. Um, I, I think things will change. Tom's absolutely right to paint a picture of the problems. It's kind of all lovey-dovey. Yeah. yeah, this will never do. But, you know, the, and obviously there's, there are many, many points of agreement. What I would, you know, what I thought might happen also was that I would try to serve the role of bridging the two <laughs> different positions by suggesting. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm totally redundant. By suggesting that the direction of travel is in the right slope, yeah. and you know we can all agree that there are problems with the huge presence still of the state-owned enterprises. Financial repression, financial markets not being allowed to be freer, but it's more in the right direction. And you compare this to what the situation was 15, 20 years ago. Over the course of this time, even with all the, the stolid inefficiencies that Tom refers to, China has grown at double digit rates 
It has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and it continues that process. So it seems to me that the way to reconcile what Tom described as is perhaps slightly more pessimistic view, and Stevens' more optimistic view, is that they're actually connected through a direction of travel. And that's really not, once we acknowledge that, then we're sort of moving in the right direction. I, I want to make sure that we discuss a little bit more what's happening in Shanghai <coughs> in this special free trade zone. As has already been referred to implicitly, this is not something that the entire standing committee has signed up to. It's not something that everyone agrees on. Just as 30 years ago, not necessarily everyone agreed that Deng Xiaoping was right in allowing the special economic zones to proliferate the way that they did, to allow Shenzhen to operate the way it did. But that's happened. That's been a huge success. Thing is, is this going to happen yet again <coughs> with the Shanghai Free Trade Zone rewriting the rules of how China runs its domestic business? And in the process, actually rewriting the world's international financial architecture. <coughs> Last time they did this, we weren't yet making iPads, but today we make all hundreds of millions of iPads in Shenzhen. And that's just shipped out to the rest of the world. Are we going to see the same kind of transformative experience so that China will actually be on the verge now of issuing the world's reserve currency, totally rewiring the DNA of the international financial architecture? Right now, the numbers are, are, are measly. Chinese RMB is not used hardly at all when you think about how it compares to the US dollar and the euro. But it's small steps. And it's more likely now than it was before. But I would like to hear the, the, the views of the real experts, Paul and Steve, whether we're going to we're set to see this kind of transformation. Well, I have to say boring. I mean, it is very boring to keep agreeing with each other. But I think, you know, I think you're absolutely right. The, 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 the direction of travel is set. It will happen. Um, I, I find it inconceivable that uh, any Chinese administration can reverse the process of internationalizing the RMB. Um, I find it inconceivable that anyone would seek to freeze the current system of um, uh, financing within the domestic economy. So I think, I think perhaps they're right. I, but equally, I think Stephen's right. This is not going to be happened over a one year or two years. He, he talks about five years. I, you know, who knows? It is absolutely right. Let me, because I want to be controversial and provocative, I hate agreeing with everybody. Let me let me point out to you, though, Danny, when you when you talk about the astonishing achievements of China over the last 20 to 30 years, we've got also to acknowledge that the next 20 years will be completely different. Um, there are a raft of macroeconomic and demographic factors, which mean that the next 20 or 30 years are going to be much, much more difficult for any Chinese administration. Just start with demographics. Um, we are now at the end of the process of significant growth in working age population in China. The working age population in China is now starting to decline, and to decline quite rapidly. Um, we are going to see over the next 20 years the emergence of a vast a vast population of hundreds of millions of Chinese who are over the age of 65 and don't have a family to support them. Um, in other words, China, to use the old phrase, is going to get old before it gets rich. And no, no major economy has ever faced uh, that problem. I was talking to somebody who's doing a PhD at Cambridge on, on migration. Effectively, we are at the end of that process that has served China so well of taking the peasants off the land, shipping them thousands of miles to Shenzhen and Wang That we're coming to the end of that process. Uh, those great untapped pools of labor no longer exist. Factories are either having to move to the West or they're having to move to Vietnam or Bangladesh or Indonesia. So the 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 the, 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 the the state of the economy, the society in which the new leadership is going to have to be operating is going to be um, much less favorable to change 
than it was in Deckard Pins. In, in a sense, Deckard Pins reforms went with the flow. They had demographic dividends, they had ample labor, they, you know, they, 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 that's not, it's not going to be like that in China in the next 20 or 30 years. China's uh, a small thing, another demographic factor in China, which is going to be a very significant effect on all aspects of Chinese society, is the gender imbalance. You know, we now have 120 boys for every number of girls in China. Now, what sort of society would we be? Traditional Chinese culture, the emphasis on the family, on marriage, on children. How does society adjust when um, you know, such a large proportion of your male population will no longer be able to marry? This is, this is all new territory. Actually, huge, profound problems. Uh, Stephen, can I get you to say some words on this, on what Paul has just injected into our discussion? reflecting on the gender imbalance and our relative experience on that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, um, the, 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 what I would say is that I, I think the characteristics that Tom is talking about are, are, are fairly accurate in general, if not in detail. And that's not a question of detail, it's just that I, I wouldn't like to question the, the, the detail, the numbers that, that, that he's implying. Uh, but the, the Chinese party has shown a great deal of ability to anticipate uh, problems well in advance and plan for them and deal with them. And I, I mean, I have my thoughts about what I would do if I was running a country with 1.4 billion people and I only needed 700 million, and I didn't believe in, uh, in, in, in early termination of life. I would have a lot of uh, strategies in mind as to what I was going to do with all the problems of population and aging uh, that Tom rightly points out. I, I'm, I'm, I, I think where, where we probably maybe have some you know, philosophical differences. I have a great, greater belief in the ability of the party to think through and anticipate and deal with these problems that, that, that we both agree are there. Um, I, I think it's um, what, what is interesting beyond that is, and that Tom hasn't mentioned, and I'm really very surprised he hasn't mentioned it, seeing as I'm sitting next to him, is, is the, the question of, of, of um, political system and accountability uh, that will arise in this changing period as well, because I think that's the other challenge that the Chinese leadership has to take. They're now in a situation where I would say that uh, they're challenged by money. Money has corrupted the soul of China, and the Chinese people are turning around and saying, this isn't quite the country we thought we were. We're not quite the civilization we thought we were. We thought we were kind of more caring and more sharing than we appear to be. We've become a French red wine society, and somehow we don't like it very much. And while Bo Xilai was hung out to dry, and was probably rather foolish in the way he behaved and, and, and maybe got where he, where, he, where he deserved to end up, and let's not talk about him at all, that there was resonance in what he was saying about the civilization of China that, that, uh, that affected uh, many other people's minds. And, and, and that is what the Chinese dream addresses. I think it is probably the most important question. The party has to connect with the people and the people's aspirations, not for uh, uh, raves into the middle of the night, watching the moon go down, whatever it is that the Westerners do in Thailand. Uh, I'm too old to go down. <laughs> but the, the idea of um, a, a society that is balanced, that is enjoyable, that is fun, that doesn't spend all its time studying for exams and working um, 60, 70 hour weeks. The Chinese people have an aspiration to a civilized life and an enjoyable life. And that means the party has to have a relationship of accountability with the people that is at present done on the basis of acceptance, not on the basis of formality. And the formal system probably won't transform this sense of, uh, uh, of a need for the party and the people to be united in their goal. But I think Xi Jinping is being extremely brave um, in producing the Chinese dream. And actually, I don't think it's got anything to do with Xi Jinping. I think it is to do with the party, recognizing that the challenges of connecting between the people and the party are of such importance that it has to be documented in a, in a document like the Chinese Dream that will throw up the questions of accountability. The Chinese, rightly enough, I'll, I'll stop uh, quickly. Our system, as shown by what's going on in America or what goes on here in the UK, our system of democracy doesn't produce the long-term growth and development that we want in our society. Well, we don't want the type of system that the Chinese have. 
That's not for us. We've left that behind a long time ago. So what is the type of systems, democratic systems and accountability systems of the next 50, 100 years are being thought about in China? And I would rather George Osborne was going over to China and saying, please tell us what your ideas about a welfare state are. Please tell us how you're going to fund it. Please tell us what, sh what share of GDP the state will be. Please tell us how you think you're going to deal with accountability, with rule of law. How are you going to share the benefits of this society? We want to know what you're thinking about so that we can get some ideas for ourselves. I think the, the, the process is beginning to turn. From Chinese being the, the students to Chinese perhaps being the teachers. They'll be very modest as teachers, but the issues are very there, uh, very really there and are very big and substantial. I think we've talked enough, don't you? <laughs> very good. We've, uh, you know, we began with a discussion that I thought we would, could be focused narrowly, if you could say narrowly, I mean, any time you talk about China, on global business and leadership. But obviously, we've expanded into the huge other areas, huge other domains, mm -hmm. accountability, gender imbalance, demography. Uh, I, I just feel re energized as if you know, we were just beginning this conversation rather than ending it. But I'm afraid that I do have to do the latter. I do have to end this discussion. If, if we may, can I just have, if there are, are there questions, one or two questions? Oh, we must have that question. Yes. One or two questions for our panelists. So, okay. so um, I'm going to begin with the woman in the scarf. Yes, if you could maybe step outside here so that you can reach the microphone. Just shout. Just shout. We will hear you. And if you could, could you just, for the record, just state your name and affiliation if you wish, and then maybe a question? Okay, uh, my name is Christina Ninja, and I'm the Franco Bros. from Staples. No, 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 not me. Discussion, especially in Hong Kong. I mean, when Li Keqing started to say, you know, when this is really in full implementation, how Hong Kong is going to position its global competitiveness. And last time when I was talking to um, Gary uh, Brimson, the chair for the Jerry, Jerry. and uh, he was saying he preferred to have a free trade zone in Tianjin, where his you know, standard life is headquarters. So my question is, you know, how quickly do you think this kind of free trade zone, you know, a special agreement could potentially spread out, not only in Shanghai, but other parts of the world? No, in China. Yeah. They don't need it in other parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll find a way. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that uh, question, um, and for the reasons I think that Stephen um, uh, made clear, um, the, the speed with which this concept develops will be the outcome of an internal debate going on within the party and the administration uh, where the direction of travel, as Penny put it, is agreed, but where there will be people who are arguing to go slowly and other people who are saying, no, no, we can't. And I don't know how that is going to um, turn out. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there are people in Hong Kong who are sucking their teeth and saying, oh my God, uh, this means that uh, Shanghai will become um, a major competitor of Hong Kong. I think those fears are overblown. Um, for two simple reasons. I think for the foreseeable future, uh, I think Hong Kong has two major competitive advantages, and I don't see those disappear. Um, one is the rule of law, um, which makes it possible to conduct a business with the certainty that any contractual disputes will be resolved fairly and in an objective and non-discriminatory fashion. There is a confidence 
in the legal system in Hong Kong that to be fair simply doesn't exist yet in China because the Chinese judicial system um, was not and is still not uh, an independent uh, agency. The second major advantage that Hong Kong has is exactly the issue that the free trade zone is trying to uh, uh, address, which is the question of non-discrimination. Anybody can go to Hong Kong and set up an insurance company, a trading company, a bank, whatever. And you know that there will be no discrimination against you on the grounds of nationality. And they do not favor Hong Kong companies. It's literally a free market. Um, and in that respect, Hong Kong is much closer to London than it is to Shanghai. Same in London. I mean, Delhi was going on about welcoming foreign investment. We welcome foreign investment because essentially this is a free market. We do not discriminate against foreign investors. We do not discriminate, discriminate against foreign banks or whatever. And so long as that continues, Hong Kong will always be a global financial centre and Shanghai will be an also it's going to require a major cultural shift. I mean, I, one of the best received speeches I ever made in Shanghai is why did Tokyo fail to become a global financial center? And I said to the, those in Shanghai, the lesson they must learn from Tokyo is that protectionism and discrimination against foreign entrants in your market is ultimately self-defeating. Tokyo could have been Asia's global thing. Tokyo could have been the New York of Asia, except the Japanese could not bring themselves in the critical days to treat everybody equally. And that is the challenge that Shanghai will face. Can Shanghai bring itself to treat everybody the same as they do in, in Hong Kong? Yeah. Um, you know, what Tom said is very important. Rule of law uh, took us hundred years to develop here at least and uh, probably in the last 40 or 50 years it took an incredible set of decisions to make sure that it's stuck um, and you can still see it being played out time and time again. Uh, the rule of law is very difficult to put in place and takes time. There's no shortcut for that. Uh, that is important. Uh, I, I would um, you know, endorse what Tom said but I've talked about a couple of other things. First of all, do the Chinese want to be a superpower and rule the world? Uh, and I think the answer simply is no, they don't, because they can see what happens. Who wants to be running around the world like the Americans? The Chinese don't. The Chinese do not want to run Libya, uh, Sudan, Somalia, South China, South China. South China. Uh, South China. Do you know, do you know, see this, Tom Smith, that point out, that um, the Americans own 10, 11, 12.3 million square miles of sea as American, uh, American territorial rights. The French, 9.8 million. The British, 8.6 million. The Chinese, 3.1 million. So I think the Chinese interests in the South China Sea are actually quite modest, Tom. But anyway, I don't know what's going on. But, 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 but. Um, uh, they are, you, 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 is not ready for China. The United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank were creations of the West after the Second World War designed to protect Western interests globally. Now that's a very um, a provocative thing to say and many people would disagree with it, but let's accept it for the purpose of this conversation because we need to have in place a new global architecture or China will be able to write its own rules in many areas of the world in ways that will not serve China's best interests. It is not in China's interest to dominate other countries. It, because it, it's the reverse of what Tom was saying about the Japanese. The Japanese were unable to treat the foreigner equally and it hurt the Japanese. If the Chinese are also unable to treat the foreigner equally, it will hurt the Chinese. So it is essential that in the way that the European Union, and I'm not talking here about the current uh, discussion about the European Union, the European Union has protected Europe from war for 60 years because it has enabled Germany to rise 
without having to use a gun. <laughs> and it's done it in a way that none of us think today of any fear of German troops or, or Germany coming into our country. The European Union has been the mechanism that has enabled Europe to lead, relatively speaking, in harmony. Well, where are the speakers from the West or from Asia talking about a form of Asian Union that enables places like Hong Kong to have a long-term future within an Asia balance between the various interests of various nations. Who wants a good Hong Kong? We do in Britain because we have a lot of money invested there. Don't the Japanese? Don't the Indians? Don't the Vietnamese? Don't all these other nations have, a, have an interest? And similarly, don't the Chinese have an interest in sharing a, a, a capital, a, a center like Hong Kong with all these other nations being able to trade together without fear of, of being imposed upon by the power of one nation? I think that the Chinese are thinking about these things. I think these are the concepts behind the Chinese dream. And I think it's, it's, it's what Danny, in his work ahead, that I think is so exciting, is going to be looking at how to create the Asian architecture that helps China protect itself from itself. Uh, yes. Uh, so next question. Question. Okay, come over here, please. <coughs> Yeah, you can do uh, so. Uh, or, uh, if you like. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, my name is Meeks. Uh, and I was listening about all the examples you gave about how this new China area is going to give uh, so much opportunities for the UK. But I would like to know if you have seen it, how it will affect other parts of the world, like Latin America, which is a very important partner. I mean, for us, China is a very important partner. Especially, I come from Peru, so China for us is vital in terms of exporting copper. So, how does this new leadership and how this Shanghai Free Zone is going to affect uh, Latin America? Have you maybe taken? Some well, I don't think the, I don't think the free trade zone is going to affect Peru. Um, the the but I do think the opening up of those uh, new South South corridors mm -hmm. uh, from Latin America to China, from Africa to China, from the Pacific area to China are <coughs> immense importance um, and have transformed uh, economic prospects in a vast way of the world, developing the world. Last week I was at the Indonesia, which is probably one of the biggest exporters of raw materials and commodities in China. And because China has caught a mild cold this year, um, economic growth has um, gone down to only 7.5%, I mean, poor things. Um, but, but Indonesia has been having a, a, a bad bout of flu uh, this year because the, uh, uh, the, the reduction in growth of exports of coal and other raw materials through China has, um, uh, has had an input. So, yes, a lot of emerging markets are now heavily dependent on the Chinese market. Um, I tell you what really gives me pleasure, though. It's not, uh, of course, it's a wonderful thing when you see countries like Peru or Brazil or whatever um, uh, prospering. But what has given me enormous pleasure is to watch the role of China in Africa mm -hmm. and to see the way in which the Chinese have upset the colonial paternalistic attitudes mm -hmm. of the West towards Africa and given Africans a choice. And I can tell you, I was involved in <coughs> dealings with Africa for many years, and I was ashamed of the way in which we used to talk to Africans, and we used to tell them what they had to do or not do, um, and we used to hold, use our aid program to uh, um, cajole them, to force them into doing things that they didn't otherwise want to do. And the Chinese have come along, um, and I great believer in competition. I think competition is a wonderful thing. And having Chinese competition in Africa, I think, has been a wonderful experience for the Africans. Africans have a choice now where they do business, who they, who they play games with. And I think that's terrific. Very good. Excellent. Question. So, from the back, now I'm picking up. Yes. Hi, I'm Jordan from Cruises. Um, so I have a question for Aaron Benny. I wonder if you guys have any sort of way of tracking the um, the media, uh, the 
transition in China in terms of how tight or how open at different times. The reason why I ask that is because um, you know the new leadership has been working hard on cutting down the production and you know uh, quite high profile um, as some of those have you know fallen in the race. But at the meantime there is you know views that saying the tightening on the social media and all the other censorship indicates that just another round of public play on <coughs> Uh, you know, very quickly, my view is exactly as you described. Certainly, the impression that one has from the outside when we read what Weibo says or posters on Google Plus or Twitter itself, when Chinese users get through to it, uh, shows exactly the same kind of the, 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 the phenomenon that you've described. There's been a crackdown, there are certain keywords that are even becoming ever more sensitive now. But so the, the sliver of light, the real hope is that in, our, in all of this discussion about the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, exactly as Tom says, the realization among the top leadership is that you can't just build it and <coughs> hope that people will come. You've got to give the right culture and the right atmosphere and the right access to information. So the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, in my view, is going to be an opening, not just for services, not just for finance, not just for international, further internationalization of R&D, but will actually allow us greater insight into freer flow of information. And so that part of it, I think, is very optimistic, and it allows what's happening in academics, in politics, to engage really productively and constructively with what's happening in finance and business. I think it's very optimistic. He's a real <laughs> I mean, if you think the way we were China is going to be breached in that, I think when Hillary Clinton announced that, uh, the, um, that the opposition to the way to the one, system, one party system in China was going to be challenged through means such as the social media, it was a guaranteed certainty that the Chinese <laughs> would react. And uh, I think what you're seeing is an enormous freedom of speech in China, except in one area. Once the decisions are made about what is going to be policy in China, if you try to organize to challenge that, you're in trouble. And I don't think that's going to change for the, roughly the same period as we were talking about how long it's going to be to make the changes in the system that they are now contemplating. So I would not expect a great deal of change in freedom of speech in um, challenging the uh, political system within the next three to five years. Beyond that, I would think there'll probably be much more freedom uh, beginning to come into the system. But right now, it's viewed as being a challenge from outside. Whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. But that's how it's positioned. Actually, for, for the record, your question also shows the sharp divide between the panelists here. Because I, I actually, I'm not only very optimistic, I think that the Green Firewall is extremely porous, even at this point. Anyone who wants to put up some resources into a VPN or connects up with somebody else. There's lots of software there that allow people to access pretty much everything that they want. Not if you're in business, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, last question. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, just a quick question. Would the uh, recent UK delegation be more effective uh, if you did European uh, members? <laughs> Do you want me to go first? Yes. Would the UK, I wouldn't be a UK delegation if it included more Europeans. I think your question has a, I'm taking your question in the broader context. Um, will Britain be important to China if it excludes itself from Europe? And the answer to that is it will lose a great deal of significance with China if, the, if a referendum was held to remove Britain from the European Union. But I don't expect us to face a question like that. I expect us to face a question around the terms of our relationship with Europe rather than whether or not we have a continued relationship with Europe. I expect that um, business and uh, common sense will show that Europe has, has a lot of advantages to it. It has some disadvantages to it, and the British want to see those disadvantages minimized and, 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 and enable um, the United Kingdom to be a little bit more independent within the flourish of Europe. So I think that the Chinese will be watching very carefully, but I don't think that uh, amongst the banking <coughs> institutions, as we're going to hear in any second now, there is a great deal of appetite for Britain separating itself from Europe. Well, you know, none whatsoever. But <laughs> let, let, me, let me turn your question around. I think this is a question.
adoption of Chinese policy, not a, not, nothing to do with British and Europeans. China, as a matter of policy, prefers to deal with the individual member states than to deal with the, the Commission and the European Union. Um, China has found it easier to pick off European resistance to Chinese policy on sensitive religious, uh, regional issues by dealing with individual member states. You will recall that just before the summer there was a proposed European anti-dumping case. Was it solar panels? Yes, solar panels. Yeah. And, and what was the Chinese response? They went straight to Berlin. <coughs> they went straight to Berlin and they got Angela Merkel, just the French wine. Uh, French wine, etc., etc., etc. So the, the, it's, it's not as if there's a choice. Um, the, 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 the Chinese will go through the motions of receiving the boot and the Europeans, but they've made it very, very clear. They have no intention of dealing with Europe as a single entity. They will deal with Germany, with France, with Britain, Italy, whatever, uh, on their terms. And it's exactly the same policy that they have with ASEAN. They will not deal with ASEAN on the South China Sea collectively. They will, their, their policy is we will deal with Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, um, and, and because the Chinese believe they have a better negotiating leverage in handling external affairs that way than um, Thank you. No, I promised my two panelists that I would let them go half an hour ago. And I've grossly, you know, overstayed my welcome with them, stretched their patience. But, you know, I need to close out the session. Obviously, the way the questions are going away, the panelists are energized in addressing them. You know, we could go on for quite a while. But I do need to bring this evening to a close. So, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank the panelists for the sterling way in which they conducted themselves. No fist fights have come out, nothing like that. So, we want to list this year. Yeah, I know. It's scary. Scary. We're we're that right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but. But before we all go, if I could invite you, the audience, to join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent.